Excellent. Um, good evening and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my name is Kimberly Wong and I'm the Public Affairs and Policy Officer at CRER and that's the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Um, so welcome everyone to the 2023 Festival of Politics. Um, this year's event uh, celebrates the festival's 19th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. Um, I really look forward to this discussion and hearing from everyone's thoughts and views. And it's really important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, um, even where there may be differences of opinion, and that we treat each other respectfully at all times. Um, <laughs> Um, so we are, <laughs> we are very delighted to have you join us today and um, to participate in Women of Colour in Politics and Challenging Racism um, and that's in partnership with the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Um, later I will be inviting you to get involved with questions and comments um, and if you're keen to continue to throw your thoughts out here then you can do that by using the channel um, at visit Scott Parle or on Instagram. Um, so yeah, I would like to also remind everyone that this event is being live streamed on the Parliament's SPTV channel. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to be joined today by um, Kokab Stewart, MSP, um, Councillor Shamin Akhtar, sorry, and Xander Yeaman. Um, so yeah, Kokab is a convener of the Scottish Parliament's Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. And she was elected MSP for Glasgow Kelvin at the Scottish Parliamentary Elections in May 2021. Um, and she is also the first BME woman um, to be elected to the Parliament. Um, so, great. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> Um, and we are also joined today by uh, Councillor Shamin Akhtar um, and she was elected to the East Lothian Council in 2012 and currently she's the spokesperson for um, health and social care and also the deputy leader. Um, and she is also the first BME woman to hold the position of a deputy leader of a local authority in Scotland. And we are also joined by Zandra Yeamond, um, who is the curator of discomfort based at the Hunterian Museum at the University of Glasgow. And as an anti-racist activist, Zandra works with the museums to gain an understanding of current social systems and how they're influenced by the legacy of empire, slavery and colonialism. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, so as I said, there will be an opportunity for the audience to uh, put questions to the panel at the end. Um, so I would just like to start with a few of my own opening questions um, and any of the panelists can um, answer at any point. Um, so the first question is, um, it was only in 2021 that the first uh, black minority ethnic woman uh, was elected to Scottish Parliament. So that is Pam Gosell and also Kokab Shirt, um, who's here with us today. Um, so what do you think having that representation uh, will mean for women of colour in Scotland? What, will I take that since I'm one of them? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. Um, I'll never get tired of hearing uh, about that achievement, actually, uh, even though I must admit I did sort of downplay it um, because obviously I see myself as a whole person. Um, but, uh, you know, the obvious visual sort of like cues are there as well. And whilst it is an achievement, I think what we can't forget is that actually it happened in 2021, which was not that long ago. Um, and the first time that I stood uh, for election was actually in 1999, uh, which was the, the, the first Scottish Parliament elections, in fact. Uh, so that was a journey. Uh, so it was an overnight success that took over 20 years. Um, so I think that clearly gives sort of like an indication of the multiple layers of barriers that can happen. And whilst men of colour uh, in politics, I suppose I, I can talk about it there, um, they have achieved success and uh, got elected, but also ministerial positions, leaders of parties, leaders of nations. Uh, the women, sadly, are still uh, distinctly missing uh, there. So that journey for women and that added layer uh, of uh, gender uh, definitely comes in there. I think for me personally, I, I was a teacher for 29 years prior to being elected. And... Um, a couple of days after I got elected, I had to go back to school uh, to say goodbye to my class. Uh, 
Um, and that was a, a bittersweet moment because I loved my job um, and education sort of runs all the way through me and it's my, my great passion. And uh, having to say goodbye to them uh, and I felt okay because, you know, it, it's part of my journey to make a difference and I had reached the limit of what I could do uh, in the classroom and I wanted to move into policy areas and have that bigger sort of holistic uh, sort of be part of that story and policy making um, but the children uh, they were inspired and their stories and one uh, was a little girl uh, primary six she was and she was a, a, a girl of color and she had read all about it. She'd seen me on Newsround, and that was the most exciting thing, uh, was that she'd seen her teacher on Newsround. And then the historical tagline that went with it. Um, and therefore, she was like, well, Mrs Stewart, you know, it took you 20 years uh, to get elected. And, you know, I, I can do this job because you're doing it. My teacher can do it. So I could grow up and I could do that too. And I said, of course she can. That's the whole point. And she said, yeah, but I don't want to wait 20 years. You, you've waited 20 years. And I says, it's all right, sweetheart, because now I'm there. I've opened that door. It is not going to take you 20 years. So somebody is now there. Well, there's two of us. Um, and Pam and I have this sort of thing going on between us because she's a, a, a regional. So her results came out after mine. So technically, we always sort of have this banter between us um, just to sort of lighten it a wee bit. So it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. But through the eyes of a child, it is actually hugely significant to have a constituency representative that represents Kelvin, the third most diverse constituency in the whole of Scotland. Um, and to live there, I live there, it's my home, it has been for 10 years. And I will talk about race equality, but I will also talk about education. I will talk about retrofitting of tenemental properties because that is a huge issue in Kelvin. So for everyone to see um, a woman of colour in mainstream politics, that visual image, but also the listening and the being part of the policy making agenda. It's a huge privilege, but with it comes barriers, which I'm sure we will go into. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, Shamin or uh, Xander, would you like to answer as well? I congratulate Kokab and absolutely uh -huh. agree with what you're saying. It's not just a positive role model for young people, it's a positive role model for other black women as well, because I'm aware of um, many women that are in um, you know, prominent positions and um, leaders of um, organisations that um, have got the skills and the expertise to be able to put themselves forward and um, but now see you and, and think to themselves I can do that and that's a really really powerful really really powerful for all women to think you know I can do that and to, to, to hear and listen um, to you speaking at the parliament and speaking and seeing you in panels like this is hugely powerful not just for young people but all for, for all women I would say. Mm -hmm. But and for you as well, we mustn't forget that actually for, with um, electoral office there are different spheres of decision making and I always say that because sometimes I think our councillors are seen as the poor relations and I absolutely refute that um, because it is different spheres of government and decision making. Uh, it's not tiers and I'm, I'm very much for that is the working in partnership. It's not a Petition is not a hierarchy um, because we often, as MSPs, are stuck in that middle bit. I don't know where that comes from in the public, but they seem to think that you've got MPs at the top and then you've got MSPs and then you've got councillors. But actually, they are different spheres. They have different areas of responsibility. And I would even argue that our councillors, who have multi-billion pound budgets, have huge and enormous responsibility. So I think, you know... Your job, <laughs> I would argue, is sort of carries a huge amount of weight with it as well. I think what's important about what both of you are saying, um, as a non-politician, well, party, po politically politician, I guess, is I hear the fact that you want to lift as you climb, and I think that's really important when it comes to representation, no matter what um, identity that, that we come from. But I think we've always got to be very, very careful about symbolism. 
and how something like representation, well, the symbol of that can be really powerful, but to ensure that we turn that into action, um, actions that actually have an impact on society for good. Uh, we see representation at the UK government level, and I have to say that that representation will, on the one hand, um, you might think that the, the, the fact that there's people of colour being represented there and the visibility of that's good. Unfortunately, in itself, it, it's got a, 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 you know, it's a particular class of people of colour and that in itself, I think, can be quite problematic. So on the one hand, I think it's great to celebrate the fact that um, more people of colour are, are having access to civic life and politics um, and it's taken 20 years. Um, we've still got to address that across all our institutions. I mean, the institution I work for has... I'm the only person of colour that works in the institution that I work for, and it's been there for 400 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Yeah, I feel like action is definitely a very important part of like trying to achieve race equality isn't just about like as you say representation, but it is very important as well, obviously, to be able to see like a woman who's black minority ethnic um, in politics as well. And yeah, I think I think to have like like as Kokab says, like all of you coming from different spheres, it's very interesting to hear what you all have to say about that. Um, Can I just add, though, there's also a huge responsibility on women of colour in politics, though, which I think is important to kind of point out, because you are there representing your constituency and you're not going to make everybody happy. And it also makes you a target and it becomes, that becomes racialised also, which I think is really problematic, because you don't find that with white people. They don't get racialised in the same way that people of colour do. And these are conversations that actually, even within politics, do, do, we, do they actually have that? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a politician. These, are these the kind of conversations that actually are happening structurally behind the scenes? Because it's something that's really important. Absolutely. And I feel like, um, like BME women especially, there is going to be extra barriers and, like, We'll, I think it blends into the next question really well. Um, but obviously, there are more barriers for BME women in politics, I would say. Um, so, for example, like Diane Abbott um, MP um, described like the online hate that she had received, and she described it as highly racialized and also gendered because, um, so this is quote, um, people talk about rape and they talk about my physical appearance in a way that they wouldn't talk about a man. I'm abused as a female politician and I'm abused as a black politician. So for the three of you here, um, how would you say the experiences of race and gender intersect with today's politics? Um, just, just you could set that to me earlier, and I thought it just reminded me of the very first election that I stood for, and it was in I'd graduated, and it was within my students' association, and I thought, well, you know, I can make a positive difference here, and in a whole range of different areas, about widening access. Um, uh, and anti-racist action plan. So I stood for election in the Students Association and I had sexist and racist graffiti on, on the posters and that was in the Students Association and when I saw that I thought I was going to stand and I thought, do you know what, I'll, I have to work really hard now to, to absolutely do my best and give it my best shot and, and I got elected and that gave me the opportunity to um, kind of call that out. You know when that was happening and also as you'd said Sandra about lifting other women as well and um, of, of providing support and, and who might be thinking of standing for, for the Students Association and that led me on to other things and the work that I saw there um, enabled me to stand for the National Union of Students because I saw um, some students within a, um, in their campus not being able to walk from one end of the campus to the other because they were they were being subjected to um, abuse and, and racism and I thought well I what can I do to, to make a difference here? And that enabled me to um, you know, stand for the National Union of Students and look at, at, and, and at that time um, help to write anti-racist action plans for students' associations to look at how they supported, um, supported constituents. Um, but I, I would say definitely there is, and at that time there wasn't social media, but I think now because there is social media, there is a little bit, well, I can kind of really say and, and do what I like. And sometimes I've got friends, um, black women who are friends, who will have something put up about them on, on social media and they'll get in touch and say, could you put supportive, you know, I, I need my support network to, to step up and come forward and, and support me. And, and that's really important of, um, you know, supporting other, other black women when they see, um, see that happening. But I think, yeah, yeah that, that does 
definitely that does happen and I think it's uh, I take that it's it's calling that out when that happens um, and I'm I'm lucky that I work with um, a lot of uh, in my group and um, a lot of uh, they happen to be um, men but they're there they're they're kind of your allies and, and support me so I'm um, you know there, there's that support network that you need from both both men and from from women as well that you can't be the only one calling that out or or highlighting that other people need to come along with you and do that and, and they, they do do that great yeah um layers there isn't uh -huh. there I mean Diane Abbott is very very particular I mean there's loads of evidence to back up what she she has stated and I mean I can see some of the people in the room here some women of color who have been activists for a long time and I'm sure we all have a story to tell not only in politics but in our activism you know um, working for an anti-racist organisation and you actually have to ca carry an alarm for your protection. So while you're being an activist, your family didn't choose that, you know, that, that's your role, but it doesn't mean your family. So there's, there's loads of layers to how women of colour um, are being treated in general by society as a whole. But the thing for me about Diane Abbott that I thought was really fascinating as well is women treat her like that too. White women treat her like that. Yeah. And so we have to also acknowledge the, the, with regards to feminism, intersectionality. That's why Kimberly Crenshaw's concept around intersectionality is really, really important. And I just don't think we're there yet. I don't think the Scottish Parliament's there yet. I don't think most of the institutions are there yet. They don't see us as a, a complete whole human being. People didn't see Diane Abbott as this complete whole human being that she is. Um, and I think that made her an easy target through no, you know, nothing she did apart from existing. Um, and we do have a lot of work to do there. And sorry, just another to add to that, even within the sphere that I work in, cultural heritage, where, you know, the Daily Mail and other newspapers might write personal stories about me and nobody really bats an eyelid. But as soon as it's a white cultural heritage worker, you know, it becomes like a Twitter storm and that's terrible what's happening to her. And, you know, get the, these are the people that get to um, sit around the table with editors of the newspapers who wrote about them. So there's also issues around class attached to that. Oh, we've got so much. Have we actually even moved forward? I don't know. Cocab, there you are. <laughs> Class thing, um, I'll sort of, yeah, I'll pick up on that. Uh, what's uh, sort of, so we've got Hamza Yusuf and Anas, and they tell this story, the, the two of them. Um, and actually, it's great to see uh, that, although obviously politically they're very different when it comes to race equality, and uh, they both actually are very supportive, and it crosses parties on that. Um, and I think that that's a healthy way, that actually it is one thing that we can all come together on. Um, but interestingly enough, um, one, they're both men, uh, but they both went to the same private school. Um, and they're actually from the same village in the Punjab as well. I mean, they didn't know each other then, but I mean, it just goes to show. So there's actually a lack of diversity in the lack of diversity um, as well. So the anomaly, of course, is here I am. Um, I, I am not privately school uh, educated. I come from a very, very modest background. I had to work full time through out my political activism because I couldn't afford not to. Um, I had to and raise two children in amongst that. And people always think that when, when you're fighting elections, it was four that I fought uh, during that 20 years. Um, uh, the first one was against uh, Donald Dewar, uh, stood against Alistair Darling. Um, so at that time, I mean, I look back and I think that was really, really good practice to stand against the big hitters. And certainly it was a great photo opportunity. Let's not be do you know what I mean? Well, it was. You know, it is a great photo opportunity. Everyone's ticking every box and everything. I'm gaining my experience. I wasn't naive enough to think that, uh, you know, all, all this sort of, you know, people are capitalising on the process. That's what happens. Um, and eventually uh, it came, but I, I was nearly ready to give up. And in fact, I had almost, I, I have started mentoring and spotting talent for the future and bringing on young women in particular, but, you know, men 
been absolutely fine, but I, I, I do encourage uh, young women of colour to uh, come into any field, but to reach the top of that field. Um, and I had done that, but there's always one more election in you, um, you know, much to the, the disgust of your family. Um, so there is that. The abuse is horrendous. I mean, it's absolutely horrendous. Um, I mean, around the, you know, it was, uh, it was during COVID, um, elections weren't the same, the coverage wasn't the same. So to have this amazing story of, you know, history making front pages women uh, was a good news story. But on the, black, on the back side of that was the abuse that came immediately. Uh, so the Islamophobia. Uh, that came through. And actually, I got it from both sides. Um, uh, I was brought up in the Muslim faith, uh, so I, I got the Islamophobia. But then on the other flip side, I also got it that I wasn't Muslim enough. Uh, so, so that was the interesting thing. Um, and then whilst there were women that were very supportive, there were Actually, there were women as well um, that were incredibly unsupportive as well and were not happy about it because I had taken the place of uh, a white woman who could have been elected and because it's, it's competitive, right? Mm -hmm. So you're competing. And we always say that, you know, in politics, there's only a certain amount of seats. That, you know, you've got to knock somebody else out of the way in order to take your place. So the people who are not there, they get disgruntled. And the expectations and the, uh, I suppose, the scrutiny is excruciating. It is absolutely excruciating. I literally cannot set a toe wrong without being overanalyzed and, um, you know, the expectations are incredibly high, which no human, as a whole human, can ever maintain that. So then what happens is that, you know, you're, you're going to mess up, you're going to say the wrong thing, you're going to offend someone, you're going to have a, a cranky day, um, you're not going to be this angelic, wonderful, well-spoken, charming, putting everyone, you know, you, as a human, we're not built that way. But when that happens, then instead of being it put down to a normal human response, it's actually, see, they're rubbish. Mm -hmm. Right? No good at all. Oh, yeah, no, honestly, really, you know, so you get written off. So you go from hero to zero <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> um, and the other uh, sort of like challenges, sort of like calling out the racism, I have to say, hats off to you for continuing. I must confess, I don't always, and that's a human admission because I am exhausted with it. And I have days that that's all I would do <laughs> is just challenge it constantly and it wears you out. And I have to make decisions on some days where I have to just sort of power through and hopefully an ally or somebody else in the room will take that up. Because at that moment in time, if I spent all my energies on that, I would not be able to be a constituency MSP. I would not be able to be an effective convener. I would not be able to do all the other things that I do. And I have to focus on that. So sometimes I must admit it's that's, exhausting. That's a really important point. It's maybe for the same for, for you, Shamina, is like racism is white people's problem so actually it shouldn't be people of color in politics or even in their role wherever they are that have to be the people that are constantly having to challenge it and deal with it and i think when going back to diane abel also when you think about it it's like the focus is a woman of colour, OK, that's fine, but she's a politician. And there's, there's such a broad level of, of um, things that people have to take on board as, as, as a politician, but it always seems to be that focus on race, including the fact that even us saying things like white people, because that's uncomfortable for many folk, because white people haven't been racialised in the same way that the, the um, black minority ethnic people have. And so, I mean, I don't know how you do that. I couldn't be a politician. It would drive me crazy. But also the anti-racist activism. I mean, I used to have long black hair. There's a reason that's silver now. It takes its toll on you. And it's a real life choice, isn't it? There's no getting, there's no getting out of it. That's it. Once you start that steamroller going, it's very, very difficult to step away. Because if you step away, people will also say it was tokenistic. You weren't real. You know, it, it's, it's all consuming. 
It is all consuming. Um, I still get, uh, it's interesting, if I, if I talk about race, um, then, I, I, and I have, I mean, I am giving you not paraphrases, I am quoting uh, conversations that uh, people have had with me. Um, I, in that context, I've had people say, uh, Kokab, there is so much more to you than just being a woman of colour. Now, you can unpick that. I'll leave that <laughs> with you. Um, so somebody saying that to your face and how I'm supposed to react to that, um, I, I won't go into what happened next. Uh, suffice to say, I'm a politician. I can handle these things in a very diplomatic manner, um, which I did uh, there. Um, if I don't talk about race, then that's also an expectation is that you know people will say well uh, and that quite rightly can come from within our own communities because I often I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place quite often because they will say well actually we have representation what are you doing with that voice you know you've got to be and I think uh, Zandra you alluded to it earlier is that it's actually not enough uh, just to be in a, a position of visibility and responsibility uh, but it, it, it is what you do with that and the personal cost of that can be quite high. It's not impossible because we do it, um, but the personal cost is quite high. You're constantly trying to please everybody and, and actually that's where the politics, that's where conviction, your values, the, the uh, party political affiliations and your own views come into it, is you have to take a line and you have to take a decision. Um, and certainly within my own party, I know that I have been incredibly challenging <laughs> um, of my own party structure uh, within we have the BAME network um, and I think I think I'm the honorary president of that now but I was um, at the inception um, uh, of it when it came about um, but of course that was helped by many years ago from the STUC um, when they set up the Black Workers Committee so I sort of cut my teeth on that in the 80s um, but again, you know, now people say, oh my goodness, this is just so fresh. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> this is not fresh. You know, these are battles that have been sort of fought for hundreds of years. And they're all, in a way, they're depressingly uh, sort of like similar to what happened then. But hopefully we'll move on to more optimistic uh, futures very soon. <laughs> No, but yeah, I think all of that really does resonate with me um, because I'm, I would say I'm very, very new to kind of like the race equality sector as a whole and like being active and as you say, like showing allyship, calling out racism, understanding really what intersectional, intersectionality means. Like it's, it's a lot for, for one person. And as, as Andrew says, like there's an expectation when you are a BME woman to kind of be able to answer all those questions, to understand fully what that means. Um, but yeah, for let's just move on to the next question <laughs> because I have so many questions um, that we could go on for that. Um, but no. Um, so the Black Lives Matter protests um, took place across the world in 2020 uh, following the murder of George Floyd. Um, so do you think that the Black Lives Matter movement has led more people to become more engaged in activism? Um, I will ask maybe Sandra first, yeah? <laughs> it was a really interesting time, wasn't it? I mean, how sad, it, it always seems to be something that moves something forward. And in this case, it was the murder, you know, of George Floyd, who was murdered by the police. Um, and it, it was, a, I mean, I, I, the role I was in was at that point, and, you know, when I think about all the, the years of my life of activism, I'd never seen anything like it. I had never seen, you know, I'm 55, you know, I'd never seen a kind of reaction like it in my lifetime. Um, and it was very stressful because at that point, working for a race equality organisation, um, everybody woke up to racism in Scotland. You know, before that, the fact that we had, you know, more racially motivated murders in Scotland per capita than the rest of the UK long before the murder of George Floyd, nobody woke up to that. You know, all the evidence of racism, whether it's overt or covert, exists in Scotland. Um, but people want to talk about, you know, um, the symbolism things. And then when George Floyd died, you know, we'd already been going through the process around Shaco Bio, you know, nobody was paying attention to this 
It was a real shock. So in answer to your question, what I think it did was it, it paused. I'm sure the pandemic played a part in that because people were bored and had nothing else to do. I'm just going to say it straight. Um, and all of a sudden you had all these people with their Black Lives Matter statement. And thank goodness for race equality organisations like the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights because they kept an eye on that. And they, you know, after a year went back to all those organisations to see what they'd done and the majority of them hadn't really changed anything. But back to that thing about symbolism. And I'm learning this as I'm getting older, because I, I hate symbolism, but as I'm getting older as an activist, I'm beginning to understand that sometimes you need symbolism and we can use that because the door's ajar. So then we try and push the door open. And it's awful, it's awful. But we are pushing that door open off the back of a man who was murdered by the police. And it's not unlike, you know, a lot of the work we do, again, you know, a lot of what we see in our society in Scotland is off the back of enslaved African people and other colonised um, countries. I think it shifted things, but I think we have to keep pushing because what will happen is it will go back and it already looks like it's going back. So opportunities like that give us a chance to push forward, but the door's starting to get heavy again. That's what I would say about it. Yeah, sort of like uh, you've used the sort of like the analogy of a door, and I often think of it as sort of like I think yes, I've opened a door. Uh, I suppose what I wasn't expecting was to walk slap bang into sort of like a glass window pane as soon as I'd opened that door, and that is sometimes what I feel like. I must admit, um, I think you make a good point about the it captured global interest and I think that social media and mainstream media had a role to play in that and because it was during Covid people were able to galvanise uh, over Zoom and over Teams and I remember that there were huge meetings that were organised overnight which wouldn't have happened in real life I don't think uh, to that extent um, although we do obviously see protests in the street and I suppose Glasgow has a history of that I mean uh, I, it was it asylum? Ken Muir Street is an example in Glasgow where communities can very quickly uh, galvanise uh, to support. And I'm not sure that would Ken Muir Street have happened had we not sort of like being used to communities coming together and having that wave effect, you know, that critical mass that happens. So I'm glad for it for that. Um, what I'm disappointed in, because I took part in some of those meetings as a civilian, um, the election hadn't happened yet, and um, I listened, politicians came along and uh, they were like, well, we can't have this, this is awful, this is a moment of change, uh, they're the change makers, and I was on that call, and they did listen. And I'm, I'm glad that they listened, but in a way, I thought, have we let them off the hook? And I say them because I wasn't part of that. Um, but have we let them off the hook too quickly and too easily? Because listening is good, but where's the action in that? Where, what happened then? You know, what legislation was changed? What policy directives then came out? Uh, where is the difference in how our boards are made up of our governance structures? Well, you know, we've had the racism in cricket uh, uh, report that came out uh, recently. Uh, well, we had the Met Police before, then we have Scottish Police. So we're, you know, talking about institutional racism. So these things are still there. So whilst these events do, I am disappointed that they become time limited and as time moves on we revert back but every time it happens with hope what I have to say is that there are more and more allies that are coming forward and what we mustn't forget also is that I was a school teacher at that time as well and the kids were all talking about it so the teachers were forced to address it and then there were materials that were coming through um, now at school at that time I can tell you now the, there were complaints that were put in by parents who objected to teachers discussing the Black Lives Matter movement and racism and everything in the classrooms because they, you know, were in that space of either the children were too young to deal with these issues, they're not, they see it everywhere, um, and uh, they didn't believe that racism really existed uh, or they they then it was that kind of double negative of uh, if you were a black teacher doing that well you were on a hiding to nothing 
because then you were completely biased and you were brainwashing the children uh, into a, a sort of like civil rights movement and giving a skew with that view of that. Uh, it's only now that we're starting to challenge that empire view, of course, because we've had that for centuries, um, which is interesting. So, yeah, that, that's my comments on it. Is I think we let them off the hook. I do. I still actually, I have to say, I'm still brave enough to challenge some of my colleagues uh, who were elected then and are elected now. And every now and then I say, I remember you were on that call um, and you said that you would do this. How are you getting on with that? And it does cause a few squeaky bums. It does. But, you know, I just think to myself, well, I'm here now. May as well, use, you know, I'll use my voice because, you know, um, may as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with analogies of pushing at the door and the allies. And I think what I saw locally was um, people coming out um, around East Lothian and organising demonstrations and um, putting up banners, etc. So that you're absolutely right about creating those, those allies, that ripple effect that we have to just keep. And it's, it, it's horrendous at a barbaric event, like that has to happen for, for us to sit up and, and think, you know, I need, to, I need to do something. So absolutely, um, that, um, th that did happen. And I think we, we are seeing some changes. So for example, all I can say about locally, and um, we meet with the local police quite regularly. So we had a, a meeting with the East of Scotland um, police constable and she said look I just want to meet with you just to you know and we had a conversation around um, the police um, saying we're institutionally racist um, and having a conversation around well what will that mean for us um, what, what does that mean for, for Police Scotland in our area what does what will you be doing differently in our local area what what difference will our community see um, if that's what your message nationally is going to be so I think locally that that kind of those allies um, are, and, and you're absolutely right, we just have to constantly keep pushing at that door and just reminding people, well, yeah, you know, we had that meeting with Police Scotland, you did say that you're going to do X, Y and Z, and what difference, what difference is that making to us, to local communities in the East Lothian, to make them feel safer? So I get regular news updates about Edinburgh. My brother lives um, in Meath Walk, and it was um, a, an assault of a young man, and the first thing I did was to check, you know, that, that, that kind of that, that, those feelings in you to check, that, is that was that was that him so those kind of things where you know we have to work and um, much keep working on, on pushing the door and holding them to account of the things that they are saying and and ways that we can support the police to make sure those things do happen at a local level and people feel um safe and secure because you know they in many cases they don't absolutely yeah i think what comes from that is like change is so necessary from things like this is not just it wasn't just a movement like it's not and it still isn't i would say and there were things before it there were things during it there were things after it and we keep needing to push for it and i think what i would want to ask you um in terms of change is would you say how much change would you say is possible within the political sphere and how much change is only possible out with it um for you um, well, it has to be a partnership, um, and it, it can't be one or the other. I've, I've lived it, and you know, I think we all have. Uh, we've been through that cycle so many times, and legislation uh, is good, um, and it is welcome, certainly. Um, and whilst it protects us from the worst excesses of discrimination, be that in the workplace or walking down the street or access to services, goods, healthcare, it protects us from the worst excesses. But what it doesn't do is protect us from people's culture and bias and the transgressions, the microtransgressions, the constant sort of like chip, chipping away. Um, Sadly, I do think we're now in a situation where when you do sort of like allude to or say, actually, this is blatant racism, the offence isn't caused, the outrage isn't caused by the fact that you have identified the racism. The offence and the outrage is that you dare to maybe imply that somebody is being racist. That, that is now the, the problem is that 
and I, I, I do have a concern that when we do sort of like see things uh, like institutional racism, for instance, that's an interesting one. Um, and when the uh, uh, running out racism, when they commissioned the report into Sports Scotland, well, Cricket Scotland, and there were 448 examples of institutional racism that were identified. I did a members debate in the parliament on the back of it. And uh, it got uh, an amazing amount of uh, support um, and um, sort of, however, on the back of that, I, I got horrendous abuse on that uh, because I was taking away the joy, the fun of it. Um, and uh, I was targeting individual people. I was not. So people were able to strip it down and it's like, well, we're not racist, I'm not racist. And I was trying to educate them and say, look, an institution is made up of people, but then it has that kind of institutional culture that suddenly emerges and we all sort of like drift along into it. And before we know it, it just becomes common practice and it's very difficult to challenge it. Now, HR policies and practices, EDIs, um, sort of equality, diversity, impact statements, all of that now I know happens. But I have to say that although all these policies and procedures are in place, what also is needed is that partnership between people changing their attitude <laughs> and behaving differently. And what I find is that everybody wants somebody else to change. But actually, the change lies within ourselves. And it is that kind of, you know, Maya Angelou is sort of like, when you know better, do better. And don't be afraid of that. And that word, I mean, uh, during one of my speeches, I talked about being uncomfortable and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable that actually it's all right to be uncomfortable. It's all right to check your own biases. It's all right to check yourself out and think, did I do the right thing? But unfortunately, we do wider in society. Politicians aren't allowed to apologize. Uh, you know, uh, people aren't allowed to say, actually, do you know what, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I, I didn't know that, but now that I know this, this is how I'd behave. Because we get, you know, everybody gets pilloried. You get condemned. But as a teacher, as an educator, I occupy that space where I think it's good to learn. It's okay to let go of maybe bad practice, bad attitudes that were uninformed, or, you know, the way out the art language use, terminology changes, um, all that kind of thing. We need to be more mindful of it. And of course, what's happened on the back of that is that then you get accused of being part of the woke, uh, the woke culture. And I've just sort of diffused it. And I said, well, literally, you can call me WOCAB. That, that will do fine. You know, I'll, I'll live with that. I can live with that. Um, but I know for some of my colleagues, that it's sort of like that kind of insult, isn't it? It's what, what you're doing here. It doesn't, uh, as, as on, you know, the Human Rights uh, Committee and everything that you alleged, uh, alluded to, um, actually, by protecting rights of one group of people, in my eyes, I'm very firm. That actually benefits everybody. It absolutely benefits everybody. You know, it's not a detriment to you. If it helps somebody, then that's grand. Um, and I'll, I'll finish by just going back to that class with that girl that said 20 years. There was a white boy in that class, and he put his hand up, and his comment was... Um, and I thought, what an amazing, you know, your parents would be proud of you, son, really. Because he was delighted for me as well. And he went on to say, he says, you know, uh, there is just so much sort of like things that are wrong. And I can see that my friends that are a different colour of me get treated differently. And I'm just so happy that you've been elected because now I can comfort my friends and say, look, you can do it and I'll be right behind you and I'll help you. And I thought, well, there you go. Straight out of the mouth of babes. Yeah, just to say that um, about whether you can make a change and difference in politics, and, or is it, I think it's both. I think we need a, a healthy civic society that challenges um, the, the, all the spheres of, of politics within, within society. And, and I suppose just reflecting on how I started off with, with politics with a small p in, in my local, local area where there was racist graffiti on the wall, there was a local pool park that was vandalised. And we thought, well, actually, we want to do something about it. Well, in um, 
primary school. And we were really um, fortunate. We had a really active um, Central Scotland Racial Equality Council embedded there, really active, um, and they had a youth group. So we were able to um, take that forward. We were able to kind of challenge. We, they gave us opportunities to be able to talk to decision makers. Um, we got the chance to go to STUC conference youth, and to talk about our experiences. So I think that's really important of, of, of activism. And yeah, that does make a difference. But then that led me to get involved in politics. I thought, I want, just as you said, Kokab, how do I make a difference to people's lives? When I, when I see um, the impact of the cost of living crisis, domestic violence, um, homelessness, um, all of those things. What else can I do to, to make a difference and support people? And I thought the best way that I could do that was to um, join a political party and to stand for the local, for local council because that was local services, public services that are used predominantly more by women than, than they are by men and more black and white ethnic women than, than, than men. Um, and that's where we need to make sure we're delivering good quality public services as, as local elected representative to support people and provide that, that safety net in society so they are able to live in a safe, secure home. That, um, you do have, you, know, you are able to um, get away from domestic violence and abuse. Um, you do have teachers at school that give you the best possible chance. And that's what I had at school. You know, I had a teacher you know, like yourself, Cab, that really believed in me and really pushed me to say, look, I know you can, you can do it. And I was the first in my family um, to, to, to go to university. So all of those fears of local government are really, really important um, of making sure we've got those good quality public services. So I, I would say both, we need good, healthy um, external scrutiny and, and asking the questions, Cab, and the accountability and, and the politicians um, saying the things that they're gonna do and actually making sure that happens. And at a local level, you are very accountable. As soon as I leave the house in the morning or if I'm doing, you know, doing my shopping in Tesco's, you know, what's happening on this issue and that issue. So you are very, very accountable and making sure that we're meeting the needs of our local community, which are, are you know, I, I kind of passionately believe that that's where we can make a difference. I think you do need it all. I mean, a lot of, um what ends up happening comes from the grassroots level. So, for instance, we talked about the Black Lives Matter movement. What was wonderful about what happened at that time was people mobilised without organisation, setting up, oh, here's a day, an event. They actually mobilised themselves, which was fantastic to see. But the other layer for me is, and, and I, I agree with both of you, I mean, I, I, it would take a lot for me to call someone racist. But what I do see is the engine that drives it. You know, and for me, one of the, the tools that are to use is memory. I think, I think memory now, especially as you get older, um, is quite radical. And institutional memory is pretty radical now because what I see within race equality, and, and not only race equality, within, the, within equalities across the board inter, from an intersectional perspective, as people forget, we've, we've seen it all before. You know, I was born a month before Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech. You know, and that speech started because an Indian Sikh man wanted to wear his turban while working in the buses. Um, Enoch Powell loved, he wanted to become a governor of India, but actually he didn't get that role. He hated Indians, he didn't get that role. So he's one of the first MPs in contemporary time that used immigration as a tool to, to progress his career. We're not teaching children this stuff. You know, and then we're jumping to, you know, the 21st century and we are continually seeing politicians using immigration as a tool to further their career. So for me, with the work we do and us getting together, you know, activists, politicians, all of that stuff, we need to be radical in our memory. You know, we talked about the S2UC earlier, you know, all the amazing work that activists um, that I stand on the shoulders of who set up the Black Workers Network, but then the S2UC, you know, lost their case of victimisation on the grounds of race, um, and none of the black workers at that point were supportive of that. You know, we need to be able to talk about these uncomfortable things, hence the reason why I'm creator of discomfort. I have institutional memory and people don't want to hear that. But for us to be able to move forward, we need to, we need to talk about these, th these things so that we are comfortable in our discomfort. Because how can we learn? How can we move on? You know, mistakes is where we learn. But if we aren't even willing to talk about the mistakes we made, 
How is there any learning? So politics and being politicians and policy and legislation will get us so far, but it's not the only thing. You know, we, we have to bring all of our values to the table. And no matter what area of work we're in or whatever we do, you know, value-based leadership for me across the board is how we have to um, progress our society in a much more equitable way. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much for all your answers. Like, um, yeah, I think like what I got from that was anti-racism. Really, you can't it's you can't confine it into one area, and everyone has to do their part for that. And you have to be active. Um, but no, thank you very much. I think I am going to open up to the floor now. Um, so I would like to invite people in the audience um, to participate in this discussion as well. So if you would like to ask a question, um, could you please raise your hand and keep it raised and we will bring a microphone to you. And if not, I will continue to ramble on with my questions. So we'd really appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> a comment when they talked about the Black Lives Matter movement see if we did this event like a week after that this room would be full what does that tell you just had to throw that comment in there um, what is a piece of media a book a TV show movie article podcast whatever about women of color in politics and activism that you would recommend <laughs> I listen to this all the time, but I tend to listen to history and museum podcasts. So I would recommend them. I mean, there's there's, there's podcasts out there, um, and I should mention the Glasgow Women's Library as well. Actually, it, it's about feminism for me, and obviously intersectionality is part of that. So anything that comes out of the Glasgow Women's Library, engage with it. My favourite book's The Colour Purple. And it's just about the, um, you know, the, the, the horrendous things that are happening there around domestic violence and the resilience and of, of, of getting out there and seeing hope. And I think it, it, you're absolutely right. It is, it is a, a tough stint being um, a black and minority ethnic politician. But you just think, you know, what difference that you're there to make to other people, to other women every day when you get up. You know, if you're able to make a difference to one person's life, um, then that's... That, that, that's worth it. The, 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 colour, the book, The Colour Purple. <laughs> um, I'm a, a big fan of uh, Maya Angelou, so any uh, works by Maya Angelou, but the particular poem, uh, Phenomenal Woman, um, that, that is my favourite. Um, and I did actually do it as part of uh, a burn supper when I was asked to do a, a, a reply from the lassies. And um, I did a black feminist reply of the lassies. <laughs> and I used uh, Phenomenal Woman as part of that. Um, as well, and that went down very well. There was a wee bit of a silence, and then it was like, you know, a clap, and I thought, well, I don't know which way this has gone here, uh, but uh, it was fine. Uh, she was a fan of uh, Robert Burns. She was a fan of Robert Burns. She was. She was a fan. Um, but, yeah, that, that's a brilliant poem, and I have it marked, and the pages, I think, have fallen out of the, that, that particular collected sort of book. Um, but I must admit, as, uh, as a politician, one thing that does go off uh, very quickly is a backbencher newly elected is reading for pleasure um, and I, I do regret that I'm slowly sort of like getting back into it because you have so many committee papers and they can be that thick and you, you're reading for information rapidly assimilating all this kind of thing um, and I do miss that because in times of great despair and you, you don't know, you know, you're in a maze, which way do you turn? It all looks very bleak. And to actually have a culture um, and to have that sort of imagination uh, of a book um, and to sort of like escape into that, I, I, I prize that and I value that so much. And it's, yeah, two, two years and a bit, and now I'm starting to read uh, books that is, and 
ironically, I'm revisiting um, the ones that I enjoyed first, and then I'll get on to new stuff. That is something that's really annoying, isn't it? Yeah. Like, because we, we read so much policy and, you know, research and reports, because you know what it's like, you're a woman of colour, you need to know what you're talking about, otherwise you're not seen as, as credible. So you over overthink, overread, over prepare. Um, I forget what it was like to read for pleasure, hence the reason why I like podcasts. But as a young woman, I loved reading Bell Hooks, and Bell Hooks actually really shaped my activism. And a key thing that she talks about is radical margins. And I come from a very lower working class background, and reading Bell Hooks really made me realise that I'm allowed to take up space. And it's not about me stepping out of the margins, it's making the oppressors walk into my marginalised space and speak my language. That shaped my activism. It's not left me. And I think we have a, another question there. Well, I, I really don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> what I really want to say is uh, to follow on what the panellists have said. Uh, you'll have noted that almost all of the authors that they've mentioned are American. And despite this accent, I've been here for 30 years. So, and I was born in the South, uh, experienced segregation universally in education, in health care, in uh, 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 city services, all kinds of things. However, an important thing to remember is that the situation in the states historically and currently is infinitely different mm -hmm. than here. And people um, lose sight on that. And, and I'm not being critical, but I am saying there is not one book, unfortunately. So you really have to divide your attention and read about several countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lived in, I've lived in three different countries, and one of them was Sweden. People think that's fine in Sweden. It is not. <laughs> but you have to read these, you have to um, expose yourself either to, in, or not either actually, to both individuals where you can, mm -hmm. where you're able to do so, and to study and read because situations in various countries differ based on their, their traditions, uh, the cultural life, uh, the homogeneity of the population, uh, their his histories, just a, a lot of things. So take care there. But Bell Hooks, I mean, I just couldn't uh, recommend we are more. And, and, By the uh, way, that's the other thing to put. I said we are of a particular yes, well, generation, I'm so. One years old, so I'm for yeah. it. Probably, I haven't looked around. I'm probably <laughs> the oldest person in this room. And uh, the situation's different tremendously. I think history's great for that, like from what Anita's saying also, if you're wanting to have an understanding of what's going on in the world um, and how racism is a shapeshifter. I mean, I'm off to Australia next week and the experience of Aboriginal people in Australia is completely different from the experience of many other people of colour from around the yeah. world. You know, they're still colonised. So, you know, that's probably why I went down that route in my activism, was, was looking at um, how we present our societies um, through objects and belongings that particularly don't come from... You know, there's the joke about the British Museum, there's nothing British in the Br British Museum, which is actually, you know, to me, that's another way of being able to open your eyes to what's going on around the world, even if you can't travel to those places. These museums are have full of objects and belongings that can make you think more about the wider world. A bit of humour, I suppose, because um, I was thinking of, uh, I mean, there's sort of like, can I use films? Is that a good thing? Because <laughs> um, sort of like books, I suppose, reflecting of uh, 
a young, uh, sort of like Asian woman um, in my formative, um, the fiction was sort of severely lacking. Um, you know, there weren't the characters that resonated with me. So, you know, the famous five generation and, you know, there was no, which character do I relate to? And I was constantly seeking that. Um, and I suppose sort of like through the years, uh, Mira Sayal, although, uh, you know, as a comedian and sort of actor and all the rest of it, um, but programmes like Goodness Gracious Me, um, I mean, in, in certain senses, they were quite gr groundbreaking at that time. Um, but Mira Sayal in particular has written uh, great books with great humour. Um, and some of them um, sort of like resonated with me coming from an Asian family and, you know, going out for madcap sort of like day trips with samosas and sand and chaotic aunties and all the rest of it. Uh, so for that kind of thing, that it was nice to have that side of you without because your life is very serious and actually most of the time other people make it serious for me because um, I think well actually I quite enjoy life I'm quite light-hearted I'd like to think I have a sense of humor um, but I get pushed into all these sort of very very serious spaces which I enjoy and thrive on but the other bit is just the 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 nurturing the nourishment of humour and just joy and sort of fiction that you can just throw yourself in. But somehow there's characters that you can relate to, that they sound like you, they look like you, you've got a wee bit of a shared history, some sprinkling of Punjabi words that, you know, you, you remember, even though it's very rusty for me now. But I find that very reassuring. It sort of validates one side of me that in certain spheres I have to sort of like hold back on and then other places so it, books and films like that are a space where I can be more myself because let's face it there are very few spaces that I can actually bring my whole self and I suppose the hope for the future is that all of us in whatever space we're in we can bring our whole selves without having to compromise any side of us. Thank you. Um... Great. <laughs> I was going to try and think of like a recent book I've read. I've been reading Audrey Lord, uh, Lord, but at the same time, I do have to say I spend a lot of the time on the internet and that's where I get most of my information. Um, I don't know if that's any help, um, but no, I'm still open to the audience if anyone has any other questions. Um, I, so you just mentioned um, hope for the future just then um, and because we've spoken here about this over really decades and decades of fighting this kind of uphill battle, how do we kind of like maintain hope through all of that? Like it's exhausting. Like how how do you not burn out sort of collectively? Like I mean, that's meant to sound positive. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, no, but that's like to the floor. Like, how do we maintain hope in this kind of line of work? I was um, younger. I had really um, fantastic women role models. Um, the, the, the director of Central Scotland Racial Equality Council, Pitt Young Berry, might be a name that's familiar to people. Um, Rowena Arshad might be, you know, Anita. Um, and just having that, you know, that those. Um, I didn't know them very well, but when I did, when I went to things and I heard them and I saw them speak, um, they were really inspirational to me. And we need people that are going to keep us going that have the same value base as us. And I think that's really important of like supporting other women as well. So I think like seeing people like Co-Cub is, is one of those things that yeah, it is relentless, it is hard, but I think that's really inspiring and making sure that we support those women and that we're, you know, uh, Co-Cub's talked about how difficult it is in, in your sphere of, of politics, whereas in mine, at, at a more local level, I don't get that level of kind of scrutiny that, that you get and how we make sure that we're whichever political party you are that we're supporting each other that you do feel that you are able to um, lean on other people and and have that safe space to say look do you know I just need to have that conversation with somebody this is what happened and have that conversation with somebody that's going to completely understand um, what's happened and, and you don't have to explain you know you don't have to kind of keep, keep explaining to yourself but I would say there's there's lots of really fantastic, prominent women in, in, in Scotland, and I find that really um, inspirational and, and motivating. To, and that's one of the things that keeps me, keeps me going. Um, yeah, I sort of, I suppose from my point of view, uh, there is hope because, you know, as Sandra said, um, 
I, I'm part of like human history, a small part of it, um, but there's a long legacy behind me and I'm sort of like um, building on that. Uh, so whilst it's difficult for me, I know that there are certain things that have been easier because of all the women that have gone uh, before me. Um, and actually men as well have played a part in that journey um, and of all colours um, uh, as well. We, we've got to remember that because there are allies uh, everywhere and there are more and more that are there. Um, and I suppose sort of like, you know, women of leadership, I mean, whether you agree with their politics and as I said, nobody's perfect, uh, but people like sort of like, you know, Diane Abbott or, you know, uh, in Pakistan, for instance, my country of my birth, you know, Benazir Bhutto, I mean, you know, to have a female Muslim leader of a Muslim uh, country. So, uh, you know, in, in, in the Begandi, you know, all these. Um, but when it comes to hope, I suppose um, I always sort of, there's one um, outstanding uh, one that I will mention, and that is Whitney Houston, who said it better than anybody, because children are our future. <laughs> and that's where the hope comes in. And maybe uh, I'm very optimistic about that, because actually we have now, we've bred a generation that quite rightly um, cares about the planet. They care about their friends. Uh, they care about, you know, they're active from a very, very young age. We have a rights-based curriculum here. Um, they're all quite au fait with all the different articles of the UNCRC. They're well ahead of government. I mean, we're still sort of like, you know, looking at how we're going to actually implement this, whereas the children are actually way ahead of us on all that. Um, they know what their rights are. We're, we're sort of like training them up uh, which is just fantastic, educating them. And now they're coming to people like me and they're not holding back. I mean, look at Greta Thunberg for one, but she is one of many, many of the, the new generation that are not settling. They have louder voices. They're very creative. They're very imaginative. Um, they're making an absolute sort of like pain of themselves, which is the right thing to do. Because, you know, when did sort of like the best behaved people ever get things done? So, you know, that kind of healthy sort of activism, but agitation, making adults like us be uncomfortable, the pester power. Um, so I'm very hopeful for the future because any young person I speak to from a very young age, um, our education system is good. We are equipping them with the language of demanding change for our planet and demanding change for our fellow human beings. It's coming from them and we cannot fail them. I don't think they'll let us, to be honest, quite rightly. You know, they, they shouldn't let us off the hook. Thank you. Um, I'm sure all of us can talk about moments where we are burnt out and we do get burnt out and we do get fed up. In fact, you both alluded earlier about, you know, you might have an off day, but it becomes a thing because you're having an off day. You're not even allowed to kind of have that, which is sometimes part of, of burnout as well. But the hope, and there is hope, none of us would be even sitting here or do what we do if we didn't believe in humanity. None of us would be sitting here having these conversations if we didn't believe in change. I think we're all of a generation where we've actually witnessed the impossible become the possible, particularly through things like legislation and equality and human rights and change that we've seen. Um, and most importantly, when you sit in a panel like this and you see a row of people, you know, of, of um, different generations, but a group of young people sitting there, that's the hope. You know, all we can do is, is um, Kokab said, you know, and, and it's great to see you sitting there, standing on your shoulders there, Anita. Um, you know, you've got people like Anita who's been around a long time doing all the pushing and shoving, and then someone like me who come along standing on her shoulders, and then the next generation is going to do that. And hopefully, you know, what Anita experienced is not what I experienced, and what the next generation experiences is not what I, you know, that's a whole other experience. That's the only way change is going to happen, is us facilitating for the next generation and learning from the next generation too. Thank you. It's all hope. That's great answers, thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Well, we also have to accept as human beings 
that the attrition rate in the movement is enormous. That just must be accepted as a fact, and, but we must keep at it. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are left must keep at it. There's so many reasons and situations why people can't continue. People who are earnest, sincere, of all races, but the attrition rate has to be dealt with, mm -hmm. and we just keep have we just have to keep at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's a process. Um, like many things, it is actually, uh, you know, as a, again, as an educator, it's sort of, you know, how do people uh, change their behaviours, change their attitudes? And it does take sort of like a generation being accepted as being approximately seven years in that sense of changing things. And that's always a challenge to policymakers, because if you look at electoral cycles, of course, they sort of like, you know, move to the fixed term model um, of like five years. So if if you've got, you know, and I always think that, that that's an interesting sort of like dilemma there for politicians is that in order to change, we talked earlier about policy, legislation, but also culture and attitudes and how you square that square, circle that, whatever pen, you know, whatever, uh, how many corners I mentioned, yes. The, I know there's something in there somewhere, whatever shape it is. Uh, but how you reconcile that is actually quite challenging with our current electoral system. Because people get elected as, a, you know, a, is sort of, um, and it's applying for a job like no other. Um, you know, it relies on sort of like no particular background, uh, no particular specialism, uh, there's no interview as such, although people would say that internal, you know, you have to go through hustings and everything, but, um, and then it's sort of like, it's a popularity contest. So when you're standing for election, of course, who, you, you've got an electorate that's maybe got 70,000 voters in it. How many of those are going to be sort of active and they're going to vote? And we know that people vote for folk who look like them, sound like them, that resonate. So already you can see that we have an issue here. Um, but that, I think, is moving. And the more sort of like visible faces and visible diversity of background uh, class is a huge thing, uh, much bigger than I think we ever give a platform to, because um, in the Asian culture, often it can be quite elite within my own culture. And I know I'm an anomaly within that because I don't come from a wealthy background. I don't go to the gala things. And I know that that excludes me from the equivalent of the golf course for instance. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. It's the same principle. Um, but if you're getting elected for five years, you go for the quick hits. And what we actually need in, you know, we need substantial long-term change, long-term generational change that takes us over electoral cycles. So hence, sometimes we get governments that go for the, you know, economic, when there's economic volatility. Um, one way to manage that, we know, is to pitch people against one another. And then it's a competition for resources. Um, and minorities are the obvious choice. Uh, you know, go for the weakest link, pit them up against one another. Whereas actually the bigger argument is against governments who are making political choices. Um, and they should be doing that. So that, that is, I'm not saying that uh, there should be longer in between, by the way. Um, you know, uh, it's sort of, uh, I'm just putting it out there as a, a thing to sort of discuss. But there's also another layer to that when we talk about policy and there's policy makers, but there's also people who are meant to enact that policy. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, I find that there's lots of great policies out there. It's just the people that are meant to enact it don't know how to do it. And that's where we have a lot of problems, I think, in trying to um, progress, you know, make for a, a, a better society is people are, are in positions of power who actually don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to take policy that, is, that is, is excellent and they don't know how to put that into action. It becomes this othering and this thing like as if you're, you know, as if it's like rocket science. But actually, I think as long as we keep people at the center of everything we do, we can't go wrong. You know, we, we, we shouldn't remove the fact that anything that the policy makers or, pol you know, politicians are there as a function to work for us. 
and part of them work, working for us is to actually remember that we exist and the policies that are made um, should actually be shaped by, by broader communities, not just one one um, part of our society, but but um, broad set all of us as much as, as we can be, and particularly the younger generation, as you were talking about. But I don't even mean the cult of young, because that's important, but intergenerational is important, as we were talking about institutional memory. Um, I don't know. I think, I think, as you were saying, because politics is like a short-term game, isn't it? And, and there's a lot of egos and such that um, play a part in it. It's really difficult to get your, you know, for us to actually embed the change that, that we'd all like to see in our society. Mm -hmm. but, but I think policy is there. It's getting people in the right place that know how to enact that policy, which I find quite problematic. Yeah, it's that sort of challenge of not letting it turn into a tick box. And I must admit, I do see that quite a lot. I mean, I have to say in education, um, I, I see that quite a lot, is that whilst there's nothing wrong with the policies per se, um, uh, once the policy's in place, it's like job done. Mm -hmm. uh, that box has been ticked. Uh, whereas actually the reality of when you test that policy, uh, for instance, like a grievance or a complete complaints procedure, if you actually test it, then you realise the flaws that are in it and suddenly it becomes impenetrable. Um, but oh, we, have a, we have a policy for that. And it's like, well, clearly it's not working. Um, but I think again, with the type of uh, person that maybe goes in into politics, you know, we do get very precious um, uh, as politicians. Well, some do. Some politicians get very precious about something they've come up with, mm -hmm. and you become so attached to that idea that actually to f see the contra evidence to that and to hear that sort of like the dissonance, you actually sort of reject that because we want resonance. We, we, you know, we, we gravitate towards people who resonate with our ideas. So yes, but I've done that. I've done that. But what we don't do, so maybe that's something, and I have mentioned it before, is that committees, uh, so our role is to scrutinise um, things that are happening and things that could include legislation that's coming from the government, but also things that are happening in society so we can rapidly react to current events um, as well as looking at policy. What we don't seem to do, I've just observed, um, is that we don't do retrospective scrutiny um, and I sometimes think that, is there a place for that? Again, I'm just putting it out there, is that instead of scrutinising stuff that's coming ahead of us, at times, uh, could committees stop, look back and reflect on some of the policies and legislation that has been passed and scrutinise that in the light of what we know now? Has it, in fact, had the impact that it was meant to achieve? Has it been value for money? Have people's lives actually been altered? And to take evidence on that. But again, we're in a political arena. And um, if any party dared to do that, you could imagine the headlines of any party would be like, oh, they don't believe in their own policy or they're admitting they got it wrong, omni shambles. So maybe in politics, we just need to turn the temperature down a little bit in that sense. But isn't that, sorry, <laughs> I, just because I'm uh, just thinking about, that's another issue I think is the fear of what the newspapers are going to say has actually had a huge impact on our society and something's got to give there, something really has got to give there. Um, it's, it feels at times that actually it's what the media is going to say is actually what's shaping what politicians are going to do. And I think I don't think that's democracy at all. It's really dangerous, really dangerous. It is, it's, it's very dangerous and it's very, uh, it's a very difficult, whilst anyone in any responsible job, um, you know, you would be careful in the positions you're in, you know, you would behave in a manner that is professional in accordance with, with all the standing orders and things. Um, however, you know, we are sort of like functioning human beings as well. Um, and the way that you can put things uh, and have them open for debate, and that's what we all want, I think. I, I do still believe that there is a space for a healthy debate and um, I think that the media plays a very valuable role 
um, in that debate. And what we mustn't do is conflate all media with that. What we need to be doing as adults is to be more discriminatory in the uh, messaging and the media that we absorb and what we read. And again, I always sort of say to people, is like, read around the issue. Um, don't just go for the headline grabbing things. Um, and I think, I mean, to be fair on the media, I think they're learning that as well. Um, you know, they're going through a bit of a transition. Uh, print media, for instance, there's far less people that are engaging with that. Um, I mean, it's consumer-led in that sense, but I, I do sense that there is a change there. I think this is where the internet and social media can be a force for good, because again, you can, you can if you click into it, of course, um, you can see a variety of views and you can compare it across the world. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to think, well, we, we see that uh, actually in the media is that whilst there is a danger, uh, Zandra, of what you're saying, I think we have plenty of examples of politicians that actually don't give two hoots about the media and they just say what they want to say. So um, yeah. Yeah, I suppose just at a, a local level, it just feels a little bit kind of slightly less confrontational. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we, we, we have a council plan, but we made sure that was um, agreed on a, on a cross-party basis because we want to work in a collegiate partnership manner. And I suppose when we've got policies in place, there's no getting away from it because you live in your local community and when you as soon as you go outside, you know, you'll get asked, well, uh, you know, what's happened with that? Um, th th those council houses, are not, have they not been built yet? Um, you know, my family's looking for a care package. So you are able to, I suppose, at a local level, kind of react a lot more quickly and kind of change when things are, are changing, when we know we've got a, a, a crisis in, in social care, what can we do differently? And I suppose that's a bit more... But a bit kind of more nimble and a bit more agile to be able to do that, whereas kind of at your level it might be a little bit more, more um, difficult and, and challenging. So I mean, the, the ward that I represent, large majority of the people don't look like me. Um, you know, I'm from an ordinary working class background. Um, my family were, um, you know, um, practicing Muslims, and so a large percentage of the ward that I represent is is is, is white middle class, working class, but we all have a, we've got a commonality because we all care about that we want a good education system, you know, all those things that it's not just as a black woman that, uh, you know, racism and discrimination, I feel passionate about tackling that, but there's all those other angles to us, as you'd said earlier, about social care, um, about health and well-being, about transportation, um, local government funding, all those things that also matter to us and that connection that you've got locally. Um, and I think maybe that's, a, thinking about it, a bit of sign of hope that I always think that's really fantastic. So it shouldn't be that if you're a black and minority person, you only represent certain areas. You should be able to stand you know, anywhere um, and, and, and you know, stand for election and, and, and get, get elected. So, I mean, that's the... East Lothian's one of the fastest growing local authority areas in Scotland and we are becoming more and more diverse, so that's fantastic that we're, we're seeing that. But it shouldn't be ruled out if, if you're a black and minority ethnic person that you only stand in certain areas, you know, should be able to stand anywhere. Absolutely, and I think, like, I think what I got from that was also that it has to be person-centred, and like, that's, I feel like that's what you're, I'm hearing a lot, is that you have to see them as people. Like, that's the most important thing at the end of the day. It's not just like, kind of characterising certain people or like, looking at people as like, certain groups. They're, they're all people. And that's what the policies are there for, is to help them. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for those answers. And I'm just gonna ask if there's any more questions. One last time. Okay, one last one. Um, thanks. I was just gonna ask, what advice would you give to people who are wanting to do race equality work in their kind of workplace, knowing as we do that obviously structural racism kind of affects most cross sections of many workplaces and most aspects of society. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'll have, I'll have a stab at it um, <laughs> as much as I can. We've covered a lot um, in response to that already, I think. So I'm trying to sort of uh, think of a, a fresh sort of way to look at it. Um, I think in any workplace, uh, sort of like a professional workplace will have policies and procedures in place. So 
start with those and make sure that they are there and don't be afraid to scrutinize them because they may have been created invented years ago um, you often find that once you actually so say where is the handbook and start looking at it they do need revised they do need updated they do need looked at um, and make sure that they're they're tight uh, but by the same token there is the people as well um, don't just leave it to the brown person in the room um, and if, if you are that person of color that is interested in race equality absolutely grand that is fantastic but if you are not interested in race equality don't be shoved into it i've had many colleagues and i've had that pressure in education actually over the years was uh, eal now i value my um, english as an additional language colleagues uh, very very highly and have worked in partnership with them it was an avenue that I was always sort of like pushed into. Um, why don't you do that? Why don't you do? And I always wanted to be a mainstream teacher. That's what I wanted. It was important for me to uh, have a class full of Wayne's in front of me and for it to be normalized was to have, you know, uh, a teacher of colour that could teach across all sort of subjects uh, in primary school. That was important to me. But there was an overwhelming pressure. Um, and at times it suited me when people said, oh, well, we're looking at this. Um, we're thinking of having an Eid event, for instance. Uh, will you do it? Now, it was sort of, we did all that in the 80s and the 90s. You're the generation where if you wanted a job, it had to be ED, you know, yeah. equal ops. That was it. it. Well, equal opportunities. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Couldn't do anything else. And it was sort of, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, in those days, the amount of samosa and sari parties, that was the extent. So that's what we've come from um, when it's addressing diversity and equalities issues in the workplace. Um, now, of course, it's, it's moved on um, in, in many ways. I know we're stuck in certain ways, but we have moved on. The, these days, you wouldn't get that. But actually, it wasn't that long ago where um, I was in a staff room and... Um, uh, on an inset day, uh, the, we were provided the management uh, paid for our uh, breakfast rolls. You can see where I'm going with this one. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was that kind of thing of sort of, you know, oh, we've put on breakfast for you. You know, isn't this great? We've put on breakfast for you. Uh, so it was bacon rolls. And um, then there was, there was bacon and potato scone, there was bacon and egg, and then there was bacon and bacon. Um, and I was like, aha, I can't do any of these. And we still have this, you know, just a couple of years ago of like, can you know, just take the bacon off? And I'm like, no, I can't do that. And it was me that was felt to be awkward, that I had created that awkwardness and tension. And then I was ungrateful. <laughs> And I thought, I'm not any of these things, you know, and then I was embarrassed. I was mortified because I was just wanting to, you know, I thought, oh, so what did I do? You know, from that moment on, I, I don't go anywhere near the buffet table in these kind of situations. I just don't. Uh, so I started sort of censoring myself in it. So in the workplace, there's all these kind of practices that you look at those are they inclusive or are they exclusive? And it's putting that lens over everything, is that if something excludes one person, you can bet your bottom rupee that it's going to exclude someone else as well, actually. Um, so good inclusive practice is actually healthy for everybody. It doesn't exclude anybody. And actually, it doesn't take a lot of effort either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got Google, you've got people you can speak to. You can, yeah. You're spot on about um, if anybody, no matter who they are, want to do race equality work in the, the, the institution they work on, they have to um, upskill themselves, they have to read, they have to look at what current policies are. And you're quite right about things out of date, because one of the issues with that case about the S2UC was that equal ops was way out of date, so even the institutions that you think are supposed to know better get it wrong. You need to read all that. You, you need to talk to people because 
one of the things that I think harms our work in race equality is people making the assumption that lived experience is enough. You need to have lived experience, absolutely, and that will inform how you can look at what you should be looking at. Um, and it really, you know, it, sometimes trying to do something with the good intention can be more harmful. So definitely reading, looking at the resources, but also talking to other people. And, you know, I'm sure many of us can talk about, you know, we were lucky that there was people, and for me, people like Anita, you know, there's other generations before us. You know, don't dismiss the older generation, you know, that institutional memory. Um, I see things go wrong sometimes because people run with something and it starts to grow arms and legs when actually all it needed was a conversation. But because people didn't have the skills and expertise, nuance and understanding of structural racism, for instance, you being the target, you're the one that's a problem, that's structural racism. But so structural racism, just bringing people of colour around the room who don't have expertise, that's a form of structural racism too. So it's about understanding all these nuances um, and not just saying, I want to be a good person, I want to do race equality and running with it. Thank you. And, and Shamin, do you, would you like to yeah. answer the question so the, quickly? The yes. comments that have been made, and I think just making sure that those policies and procedures are are robust and that shouldn't be your that shouldn't be all of this shouldn't be your responsibility there's senior managers there to do that and what are um, and i also look you know we've got policies and procedures in place but also look at people's actions you know how do they how do they um, interact with with you know other other departments or the constituents how do they give them feedback i think that's 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 really really important but it shouldn't only be your your response your responsibility but it's, it benefits the whole organization when we get equality race equalities and equalities issues right it benefits the whole organization it benefits everybody working in the organization and i'm more likely to access and use an organization when i know it treats its workforce really well it's got positive um, you know practices um, and, and I can see that people are being treated well. I'm more likely to access your services. I'm more likely to buy services from you than ones where I think, you know, I've, not, I've heard they've got poor practices. But when you've got good practice, you know, art, articulating that um, clearly that this is the kind of organisation we are. We are an anti-racist organisation. You know, we do care about the local community and how, what difference we, we can make. I'm more likely to to, to support you and, and buy your services and, and access you, then, you know, if it's, yeah, if it's not. Business, yes, we walk back to, and it connects this question that you just asked and, and the question you asked about hope. What I do see, which I think is great about the, the younger generation, is intersectionality is very natural to them in a way that we grew up with the protected characteristics. So I'm still having to deal with people where they go, well, that's not for me, without folk realising actually everybody is a protected characteristic. You know, that, that's the point of the equality legislation is it encompasses everybody. But what I love about the younger generation and, you know, your question about hope is intersectionality is becoming such a kind of normal experience to them. So you've got the equality legislation with the protected characteristics, the tick boxes stuff, but the inclusion and the inclusion is that stuff that is not in the legislation. The, you know, loads of organisations are good at equality, diversity, but the inclusion is the bit they're not good at. And I think the next generation is really kind of going to take that to another level. Well, actually, I expect you to do that, <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think we've run a, a bit on, um, but thank you very much for all your answers, and I think that was a great place to end it as well. Um, thank you very much for, to our panel, so Kokab, Shamin, and Zandra, for all of your really thoughtful answers. That was really helpful, um, especially for me. And can I also take a moment to remind everyone to fill out the survey that you will receive automatically if you've booked via Eventbrite or if you have a few paper copies of the survey at the back as well um, so that would be very much appreciated if you could share your thoughts there um, and then can I also take this opportunity to remind you that there are a lot a, a lot more festival events taking place um, over today and tomorrow uh, including discussions of the future of broadcasting at 11 um, and also talking to boys and men about gender-based um, at 3 p.m. and also uh, the future of Scotland's art and culture at 5 and that's just a few of them so please do look online if you're interested uh, please do join um, but thank you all very much for participating today and that's all from me yeah thank you, thank you.